What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com, your home for the 2020 World Series champion Los Angeles Dodgers. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined this week, as always, by Daniel Starkin. Daniel, last time we talked, you were holding a broom. The Dodgers had swept the Padres. Momentum was headed in the right direction. Slightly different mood after losing two out of three against the Rockies, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely a, a much different mood, I guess. This weekend was, you know, a bit of a reality check for the boys in blue. You know, they're not going to just skate by and, and beat all these teams. You know, the Rockies, their record might not be great, but they're they're a feisty little team. You know, they played hard, uh, you know, and they came out and won two out of three. And honestly, it's a, it was a big missed opportunity for the, jo- the Dodgers because, you know, the Giants also lost two out of three. And we know how... Yeah. Uh, few and far those losses are in between you know over the last month how hard it's been for the Dodgers to to make up ground in this division and this weekend was you know a perfect opportunity to do so even if you just take two out of three I'm not even asking for a sweep but you take two out of three you pick up a game you're only a game and a half out uh, you know that would have been nice but <laughs> of course it, it didn't happen the Dodgers are still two and a half back and they got you know a big week ahead this might be the biggest week of the season coming up right here so uh it's time to get back on track because if they play specifically if they hit the way they did over the weekend uh this upcoming week then it's it, it's going to be a bad week absolutely well lots to go lots to talk about today and we will get to the weekend the week series against the braves and then the giants braves one of the hottest teams in all of baseball and then the giants of course the best team in baseball so here's the plan for today we're going to do a quick week recap in just a second. I've got a question of the week that I think is going to frame us up. We'll do stock up, stock down. We'll do weekend quotes. We'll talk Clayton Kershaw injury update. And then as I said, we'll do a little Braves and Giants preview as well. So let's talk week in review. Again, the Dodgers sweep the Padres. We've got the 16 inning deal on Wednesday. We don't need to rehash. They come into the series against the Rockies. Momentum is high. It feels like things are headed in the right direction. Kyle Freeland absolutely dominates them on Friday. The Dodgers lose that game. They bounce back on Saturday. Will Smith, big home run to win that one. And then Sensatella shuts them down on Sunday, and the Dodgers get shut out. They lose two out of three to the Rockies. By the way, this is a Rockies team that was the worst road team in all of baseball. I believe they were 15 and 47 on the road. They take two out of three against the Dodgers. But it all leads to my question of the week, and it's really focused on one specific word, Daniel. My question is this. Are the Dodgers playing and managing with enough urgency. Urgency is the word that I can't get out of my head after the last few days. And I'll give you three reasons why I ask, and we can go through these one by one. The first thing, and I was if you follow me on Twitter, I was fired up about this when I looked at the lineup yesterday. The lineup decisions communicate to me that it's possible that the Dodgers do not have the requisite level of urgency to climb back on this two and a half game deficit with 31 games to go. Okay, with 31 games to go, this was a quote Dave Roberts said, Mookie Betts enters into the lineup on Thursday And he says, you've got three outfield spots, four very good players. I think it's me divvying up playing time, giving rest to each guy, which they're going to need at some point. A little bit of a rotation. I've got some good options. Since Mookie Betts has come back, he says four outfielders, three spots. Billy McKinney has played twice in four days over that stretch. So on Thursday, Mookie is back. Max Muncie is out with back tightness. Chris Taylor, regular day off. Friday, Max Muncie, precautionary, held out again. Albert Pujols takes his spot. Cody Bellinger gets a day off. He doesn't count as a regular. He counts as the outside guy looking in at this point. Saturday and Sunday are the big ones, though. You know that you've lost Friday. You know that you're two and a half back. The Giants are playing a good Braves team, that you have a chance to gain ground. What does Dave Roberts do? Corey Seager gets a day off. A.J. Pollock gets a day off. Sunday, Justin Turner gets a day off. Will Smith gets a day off. And Mookie Betts gets a day off. I joked on Twitter, the Dodgers have a full all-star lineup available for Dave Roberts. He absolutely refuses to use it. I get that you want to rest, guys. I get that injuries are heightened this time of year. But to me, it feels like we're going to have a healthy team playing in a one-game wild card if Dave Roberts continues to make decisions about the lineup the way he has. Do you see things the way the same thing, same way I do, or am I missing something here? Uh, I, I guess I see like both sides of this, right? Like, obviously, you want your guy, your best guys in there every day. Like, this is crunch time here. We're sitting here on August 30th, and you know so the calendar is about to turn to September, yeah. and the Dodgers are not in first place, you know, and they're two and a half back. It's not like they're one game back, and that could change tonight either. Like, they're still two and a half back. The Giants are not slowing down, so I, I, I get it. You want to be urgent, but but I also see the other side where it's like. Basically, every single one of these guys has been dealing with some sort of injury, like at some point this season. And and the, the end goal is still to win a World Series, not necessarily to win a division, not to win games this week um, or whatever. Like, I, so I get 
I get that part of it. And and if we're being honest here, like a lot of these guys that were getting days off, part of that is also because they've been slumping. Like it's not like it's not like Justin Turner has been tearing the cover yeah. off the ball recently. You know, Mookie Betts, who just came back from injury, I believe he's like one for thirteen since he came back. And you also with him, I he, he's probably the most understandable totally. of the bunch, I'd say, because you just gotta manage the hip injury. Um, you already mentioned Bellinger, Bellinger, who doesn't belong in in the conversation uh, with regulars. So, so I guess there are some scenarios where it makes sense to sit a guy, um, but there are there definitely are some where it hasn't made sense. Like you know, Chris Taylor is an everyday player. He's shown he could be an everyday player. AJ Pollock has been you know the best hitter in baseball over the last month and a half. Um, he he could also play every day. You know, um, so so I guess. You know, I see both sides, but I definitely, I definitely think Billy McKinney in the lineup two out of the three games against the Rockies. That's that's a little bit too much for my liking. Like maybe maybe one game is fine. Like get him in there, get him some at bats. But he he he. I don't. I think I feel like he's being like treated like on the same level as like yeah. the starters in the outfield. Like hey, we need to get McKinney these at bats, and and I just never have really quite understood that. So a little too much McKinney for my liking. But I still think there's a way like to to still put a really good lineup out there every day and, and still be able to bench, you know, one of your regulars and let them get some rest. Dave Roberts mentioned how there's four outfielders for three spots or whatever. Um, and, and the way you can mix and match you basically right now, the Dodgers have nine guys. If you count Cody, which, you know, who knows, but they got nine guys who are you yeah. know worthy of, you know, everyday playing time and you could rotate those guys and still get guys rest. So I think there's a better way to do it than the way they did that lineup yesterday. To me, there, there should never be McKinney and Barnes in the yep. same lineup, in my opinion. You know, you could have one of them in the eight hole, and that's perfectly fine. But to me, when you start having both of those guys in the lineup and Cody, yep. who, who's, you know, been just as bad, if not worse than those guys this year, that's that's the bottom of your lineups looking very, very weak right there. And you're not going to do much damage. Uh, so, so, so I see both sides. I think there's a way to do it while not benching yeah. three guys all on the same day. Um, so, so yeah. And that, and that's, that's where I'm getting at. So Billy McKinney has played three out of the last four games. Cody Bellinger has played three of the last four games. And you, this is with, this is since Mookie Betts came back. So to your point, totally agree. Mookie Betts, three days on one day off. Totally get it. Giving some of these guys a day off. Totally get it. The Dodgers have an off day this week. They had an off day last week and you have nine guys for eight positions. So I I just don't get why we have to see all of these guys out at the same time. If you know Mookie Betts is sitting out Sunday, then Justin yeah. Turner shouldn't be sitting out. Will Smith shouldn't be sitting out. If you want to do the, oh, well, it's a day game after a night game, then rest one of those guys on Saturday. And then don't rest Corey Seager and A.J. Pollock. Like, to me, the idea that these guys can't play 12 games in 14 days, like A.J. Pollock and Corey Seager need more than two days off in a two-week yeah. stretch. Like, Justin Turner, okay, right. he's getting up there in age. But, like, Max Muncy, I understand, back tightness, sure. But, like, Chris Taylor, Corey Seager, A.J. Pollock, Will Smith even, like those guys need more than two days off in a 14-day stretch. I just don't see I don't get it. And this is crunch time. And yeah. I understand to your point, hey, we're playing for a World Series. Well, if they end up in the wild card game, their World Series odds drop by about half, if not more. And so that's the part to me where it's like, I don't know. I mean, I recognize Dave Roberts has won the division every year. He's used to having the best team. I'd have to go back and look. I don't know what kind of division races he's been in. I definitely don't think he's been two and a half games out with 31 games to go. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm forgetting one of the last six or seven years where he's had to deal with that. But man, I just, I don't like, he justifies it like, well, of course Turner's sitting on Sunday. Well, it's like, okay, well, if you knew that, then why does Will Smith's off day have to be today? Why is Mookie's off day today? Why is Seager and Pollock the day off before? Because Seager and Pollock both come in as pinch hitters and Corey Seager stays in the game. So you're telling me he could come in at the end of a game and play, get two at bats, but he can't get four. So to me, it's just frustrating when the offense is struggling as badly as it is. And totally fair point. We're going to talk about in a little bit. These guys haven't been great. So it's not like Corey Seager's hitting 500 and getting benched. But like Trey Turner's playing every day. Um, a lot of these guys are playing every day. It's just... Some of them aren't, and that's the part that doesn't make sense. So for me, the lineup is number one where I'm frustrated and there's some urgency. The second piece to me is the rotation, and this is an interesting one. A lot of people, this is chatter going on about this because we know the Dodgers have one series against the Giants. It's upcoming this weekend. The Dodgers had an opportunity to set their rotation up so that against the Giants, you would get Urias, Bueller, and Scherzer, the three days of actual starting pitchers 
rather than bullpen days. By the way, it would have kept all of those guys on normal rest. So it would have been a normal five-day rotation. Urias Bueller Scherzer moves everybody up slightly. The Dodgers do not decide to do that. They decide to give everybody an extra day of rest, which means that Max Scherzer will not pitch against the Giants. To me, this one's more defensible than the lineup thing. But still, you know you've got three games, the most important games of the season. I know Urias' pitch count. But Bueller and Scherzer especially, I just to me, it's more defensible, but it still, to me, feels like a team that doesn't realize exactly what they're up against. Yeah, yeah, this one, uh, uh, I'm with you on this one. I, I think, to me, well, you said this is more defensible. I, I'd say this is probably not less defensible, but this one, like, to me, this is the easier. Like, we could have just done this, and it would have made perfect yeah. sense. Like, you, those Giants games, A, these are your last three games against the Giants, so these are the last three games that you could control, like, where you go in the division. After that, it's outside of your control. Yep. You're going to need other teams to beat the Giants. So these three games, they they count for double. So you need to have your best guys out there. And it's not like they would have had to do rearranging right. to make that happen. They just had to keep everyone on turn and on normal rest for one week, which I get that the Dodgers like giving guys extra rest. Like guys are have thrown a lot of innings this season. Like you want to try to limit them when you can. But to me, do that next week, yeah. you know, do that the week after that. Like let's, let's focus on this week and winning this week. We got two tough series coming up against the Braves first. And then the biggest series of the year against the giants. We need to be in the best position possible to win those games. And guess what? If you win five of those six games and sweep the giants or whatever, then, then you're in first place. And now, you know, your destiny is in your own control. Yeah. Now you just have to win. You don't need to hope other teams beat the giants or whatever for you to make up ground. And then who knows, maybe from there you take all the momentum and start to build a bit of a lead. Uh, and then, you know, the last two, three weeks of the season, you got a comfortable lead and you could skip guys or you could move guys back to limit their innings or whatever. To me now is just not the time to be doing that. Like, as we've talked about, this is crunch yeah. time right now. Uh, especially the series against the giants. Like that's, I've said it a couple of times. That's the most important series of the season right now. You got three games to try to, to try to knock them out and try to take over first place. And to me to not have Max Scherzer pitch yeah. in that series, like that just seems ridiculous to me. That's why you go out and get a Max Scherzer. That's the whole reason is so he could pitch in those games and win those games. Like, great. You got uh Bueller and Julio going in two of the games, which is what you want. But now we're looking at the difference between Max Scherzer in the third game and a bullpen game with, I don't David even know Price. who it's going to be, Andre Jackson. David Price set up as the oh, opener David. on Friday. Okay, so David Price, who who hasn't been great yeah. as of late, if we're being honest. Um, so to me, that was just a huge missed opportunity. I, I get wanting to limit guys' innings, like especially, you know, Bueller and Julio. They, they both are pretty much at their career high in innings, but at the same time, we need to beat the Giants, and I want you know, our best guys out there to beat them. Yeah, and, and again, like, I can't emphasize enough, we are not asking the Dodgers to do something crazy. We're not saying, hey, throw these guys on short rest so that you set them up for the Giants. Right. It was normal rest. Like, everyone would have gotten four days off in between starts. They missed the opportunity. Yeah. And again, these are just the decisions where I get the long-term view, but sometimes it feels like we're not used to this because we're not used to these games being as urgent and as important over the last few years. Exactly. It just feels like they're getting cute. It feels like it's saying, ah, we're just going to continue doing things the same way as if we were eight games up in the division, when the reality is we're two and a half games back, and destined right now for a one-game wildcard playoff in which you could face a guy like Luis Castillo in that, in that game. So that was number two. Number three to me, I, 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 I'll be honest, like Sunday, I had a lot of stuff going on. I wasn't quite dialed in. I woke up Monday morning to the news that Justin Turner pitched a scoreless ninth inning last night. I, I, I didn't even know what to think. They, the Dodgers threw Kenley Jansen in the eighth inning of this game yeah. on the third straight day. And then, yeah. they, and then Justin Turner in a 5 to nothing game, an, an important critical game. Okay, so let me break this down. Here's some Dave Roberts quotes. Quote, we had some guys we wanted to stay away from. When you're down 5 nothing and you've got three hits through eight innings to use a leverage guy in the ninth, I didn't feel good about that. Talked to Justin. He was on board with saving the pen. I've gone on and on about Justin, blah, blah, blah. As for Kenley, I just felt to stay away from Blake to potentially give us one plus on Monday. Kenley was on board with doing that. It wasn't any kind of role reversal. It was more of how are we going to get through this game the best way we can. Um, Justin, he was asked a follow-up question. He says, you know, basically, hey, normally you don't use a position player in a 5 to nothing game. Quote, I went to him. 
the way we leaned on Alex Vesia to get him in this game and have him down the next day or two against the Braves in a game that, in my opinion, unlikely we were going to win given how we performed the last couple days. Think about that for a second. Unlikely we were going to win based on how we played the last couple days. It saved a leverage arm. I would do it again if the situation presented itself. So I looked this up. This season, there have been 10 games at least. Uh, this was just like the top games, but there have been at least 10 games in which a team has won with less odds to win, to come back and win. Those weren't games featuring an all-star lineup against one of the worst bullpens in baseball whose closer is imploding. To me, this is indefensible. I mean, like, there is no defense of this one. None. Five to nothing. You're the Dodgers. You have an all-star lineup. The Giants have lost and you need this game. It's not 10 to nothing. It's not 16 to nothing. It's five to nothing. You've just pitched Kenley Jansen back-to-back days right before it. I mean, this to me is the perfect picture of like, we're not even trying. You threw in the towel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to do a double take when like the it, the TV comes back from commercial and like Justin Turner's on the mound. I was like, that, that I'm, I'm with you. This this was, you know, the least defensible to me. This made no sense. And, and you got to kind of look at it as with the Jansen thing involved in it too. Cause like on the surface, like you're down five, nothing. Like if you want, if you want to save your bullpen, like you got an important week coming up, like fine. Like I, I don't agree with it, but like fine. But, but at the same time, you can't do that one inning after you just pitch your closer when the score was the exact same. Like, it's not like Kenley came into like a one nothing game or something. And then, you know, the Rockies tacked on more runs to make it five, nothing like the score was the same. Like, so at that point, you're either in or you're out. Like, either let's go full on position player pitching and save Kenley too, or or let's you know let's use our guys and hope we could come back and win this game. As you said, it's not like the Rockies have a lockdown bullpen. I know the Dodgers bats have been struggling, but they, they they've scored five runs in an inning plenty of times this year. Like that's not that's not impossible. Like it's not ten nothing. It's not eight nothing. Like five nothing. Teams come back from that all the time. So it, you, to me, you either got to go one way or the other. I would have went the way of let's pitch our guys and hope we could come back. Because as you said, with with the Giants losing yesterday, that was a golden opportunity to pick up a game right there. Um, but to me, like it's not like it's not like Kenley hadn't pitched like earlier in the week and they needed to get him some work and they had another off day coming up today. Like no, it wasn't like that at all. As you said, he had just pitched in two other games previous to that. They don't have an off day today. They start the series with the Braves immediately. And and obviously the expectation is those are going to be competitive, close games. You're going to need Kenley in probably two of those three games. So to me, that just didn't make any sense. Um, you know, good for Justin Turner, I guess. He put up a zero. So, it, it, you know, he didn't make that de- deficit any larger. And ultimately the team wasn't able to come back. But to me, you just got to decide which way you're going, like, going with your closer in the eighth inning and then a position player in the ninth. Like, that just, that doesn't make any sense. Well, and okay, I mean, remember that Justin Turner was getting a day off on this day because apparently he's so old and so fragile that he needed rest, but oh, hell, we'll just throw him on the mound to get us an inning. But I look back, I mean, Shane Green got one out in this game. He threw six pitches, and he was the guy right right before Jansen. So at that point, it's like you probably, I hope, have some semblance of a plan. He's closing out the seventh. Like, ride Shane Green for four outs and then bring Jansen in for the ninth. Or, like, you know, like, right. there's lots of ways. Bickford pitched the day before, didn't pitch that day. I get wanting to rest people, but to me, it's five to nothing. <laughs> this game, like, far crazier things have happened than, than this. And so, to me, this is where you put all the pieces together. This is where you can say, hey, the lineup thing, I get it. Or the pitching rotation thing, I get it. But then you put the pieces together and you say, but how do you explain the pitching rotation piece? where they don't make an effort to set up against the Giants, and yet they're still resting everybody offensively? Or why are they setting Justin Turner? Like, those three together paint the bigger picture to me yeah. of just ultimate levels of frustration. Because, again, the word I'll use is urgency. I don't see it. And I'm watching the yeah. Giants not lose enough games. And there's only 31 games in the season. And if we're not going to be urgent now, when are we going to be urgent? My worst nightmare is this one-game playoff. And it feels like, it feels like Dave Roberts and friends – are, are very uninterested in, in behaving in such a way as to give themselves the best chance to get out of that game. That's just me. So when I put it together, that's the frustration for me as a fan. I'm guessing I'm not alone in that. But, man, it, it's, it's hard for me to watch and stay engaged on a daily basis when I don't feel like my team is giving the best 
I'm not even talking about effort. I'm not saying these guys aren't trying. I'm saying before they even start to try, the decisions that are made are not setting them up for success. Yeah, yeah. And to me, it comes down to management. You hit it on the head a couple minutes ago when you said, you know, they're managing these games like they're up eight games in the division instead of back two and a half, which, you know, if they were up games or up eight games, then all these decisions would make a lot more sense. Like, obviously, you're looking ahead to October, but unfortunately, they don't have that <laughs> that luxury yeah. right now. And they're they're managing like they do. Um, but hopefully that changes. Like, I, I'd hope they understand the importance of this week, especially like you got a, a, a hot Braves team coming in. Um, and then right after that is the series with the Giants. So, you know, that all that stuff uh, was all fun and dandy. But now it's time to really buckle down um, and, and we got to win these games. You know, there's there's no uh, later at this right. point. You know, the time is now. Yeah, may, maybe September. Maybe September 1st is the day Dave Roberts just flips the switch. <laughs> And who knows, like, right, if that's, I want to be optimistic. two days away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe the optimist is, hey, they're resting these guys because from here they recognize this is a big week and nobody's been sitting out. Like, Turner, Seeger, Mookie, all those guys are playing all week long. You know, I think they said with Muncie, right. he's planning on playing the entire week. So maybe that's it. The pitching thing's hard to explain. The bullpen thing's hard to explain. So maybe it's just gearing right. up. Like, this is the last day of that stuff, and we're turning the page and Braves and Giants, and it's just full steam ahead, you know, We'll see. I mean, I, we'll talk Cody Bellinger in a little bit and whether they're actually going to bench this guy every single day as they should, but remains to be seen. So you let us know in the comments below. Am I crazy? Are the Dodgers managing with the right amount of urgency? Uh, let me know below. Let's shift gears a little bit. We'll go to stock up and stock down. Uh, I'll start this one with a trivia question for you, Daniel. Do you know who leads the National League in fan graphs wins above replacement? The hitter. Overall? Hitter. Yep. Yes. Hitters. Um, no, I'm not sure. He's a Dodger. Yeah. Is, I mean, I would guess Muncy, but I, I don't know. He's been slumping Trey recently, Turner. so probably not anymore. Trey Turner, oh, number okay. one in all of the National League in wins above replacement, according to fan graphs. Uh, I think Bobby and Ardaya mentioned this in his article. He's sort of a dark horse MVP. Nobody's ever won the MVP switching teams. Trey Turner has done it. He's first in fan graphs war. He's fourth in baseball reference war. Obviously, Tatis is slumping. Uh, Muncy's a guy that belongs in that conversation as well. But just something to watch. You know, we're going to talk about a lot of guys that are slumping. Trey Turner not slumping. So could be an interesting down the stretch there. You've got Walker Buehler in contention for the Cy Young. Trey Turner um, very much in the thick of the uh, MVP conversation as well. So stock up and stock down. This isn't going to be an overly positive one here for either of us. But <laughs> I'll let you start off with a little bit of positivity. Yeah, yeah, I'll start off with the stock up. As you mentioned, you know, there's pretty much the whole lineup is stocked down right now, except the guy you mentioned, Trey Turner, who's been, who's been great, as as we all, uh, you know, have enjoyed. You know, I think everyone, every Dodger fan, you know, loves when he comes to the plate and when he's on the base pass. Like, it's, it, it feels like it's much watched uh, TV. Uh, but the the only other guy hitting right now is Will Smith. And he's, he to his credit, he's absolutely mashing, you know, seven for 14 over the last week. Three homers, all of which seem to be, you know, clutch <laughs> yeah. homers in big spots. And and even, you know, the the non-homers, even the hits have been clutch hits as well. He had the two-run game-winning single the other night. Um, so, I mean, I feel like we've run out of words for Will Smith. He's he's seemingly getting better as the season goes along, which is just incredible for, for someone, you know, young like him who hasn't really played a full 162 major league season. Like, this is his first full uh, season with the Dodgers, which... It feels weird because he's been around for so long, but also with the pandemic and everything, you know, a shortened season. This is the first time he's been, uh, you know, around for 462 games. And he's, I mean, he's making the most of it. He's got 21 homers. That's now second on the team. He's He's been among the MLB RBI leaders since the All-Star break. So, uh, you know, we, we if you're talking about MVP, you yeah. know, I think this is a guy who's, whose name might be entering the conversation if he, you know, keeps us up you know, for, for, the, for the next month or whatever. Yeah, so slash line for Smith the last week, 500 batting average, 611 on base percentage, 1.143 slugging percentage. So he's got an OPS of 1.8 basically over the last seven days. Um, that leads into my first stock down, which is every Dodger hitter not named Trey Turner and Will Smith. This is the yeah. last seven days batting averages. A.J. Pollock, 217. Now, if you think that's bad, that's third on the team over the last seven days. Corey Seager, 200. Chris Taylor, 150. Austin Barnes, 143. Justin Turner, 136. Cody Bellinger, 136. McKinney, 111. Betts, 091. Muncie, 063. Yikes. 
Then we get to Pujols 0 for 6, Beatty 0 for 2, Lux 0 for 1, and the Dodger pitchers 0 for 11. So third on the team is 217. They've got three guys hitting over 200. At 200 is Corey Seager. You'd think, hey, this is Cody Bellinger. He's settling in. Maybe he, he gets a bump on the team rankings after this. No, he's he's right down there in the middle. McKinney, 111. Again, you said it. Mookie Betts since coming back, 091. Muncie, 063. Chris Taylor, 150. And then, I mean, like, pitchers, 0 for 11. Like, you don't expect your pitchers to do anything. But you're like, maybe we get one hit out of 11. But um, <laughs> it's worth noting, this is partially against the Rockies team, who has been dreadful. Starting pitching, entering, entering the Rockies series, 4.47 ERA for the Rockies. Um, they proceeded to go six innings, two earned, seven Ks from Freeland. Seven innings, two hits, no earned from Sensatella. Gray got pulled early, two innings, one earned from him. Just a 1.80 ERA on the series. So three runs better than average. Their relief pitchers entering the series, a 5.24 ERA. They finished with a 3.27 ERA on the series. And if you take Daniel Bard out, who's been dreadful, who I believe got no outs and gave up three earned runs, if you take him out, then they allowed just one earned run in 11 innings pitched outside of that. Um, this is a team I mentioned 15 and 47 on the road entering the weekend series. That was the worst in baseball. Um, and one more note on the Dodger offense while we're here, not just to pile on. Um, in the last 13 games, they have scored more than five runs just one time in their last 13 games. They've scored more than four runs just 14, four times um, over that stretch as well. So nine games of three or less runs over the last 13 for the Dodgers. Um, just pitiful, pitiful for a lineup where you expect better. And it's worth noting, by the way, one of those four-run games or five-run games was in 16 innings. So they needed an extra seven to get to there. Uh, the lineup's been dreadful. There's not much more you could say. Stock down everybody except for Will Smith and Trey Turner offensively. Yeah, yeah, and you mentioned the Rockies series and and also the Padres series, but to me, that's when it kind of started was against the Padres, yeah. that that 16-inning game. Obviously, you know, they had six innings or whatever it was, five innings with a runner on second base and couldn't even score him. Like, that's that's how bad it was. Like, we not only could the Dodgers not score runs, but they couldn't even – they were given a free runner on second base and still couldn't score. Um, but I guess you, you kind of understand it against the Padres, like, even though uh, – even though they're scuffling right now, like they, they still got some solid pitchers like Blake Snell not having a great year, but has the Dodgers yeah. number for whatever reason. Uh, you Darvish came back and they actually got to him a little bit, which was good to see. But the Padres also, they got a really good bullpen. So you kind of understand it in that series. And, and uh, you know, they ultimately they still were able to get the three wins. So you kind of look past uh, the offensive scuffles. But against the Rockies team, which you mentioned, like one of the worst pitching staffs in baseball, it's like that that's. That was really disappointing to me. Like that was a prime opportunity for them to come out, um, yeah. you know, and play their best ball and and make up a couple of games on the Giants there. And they, you know, completely squandered it. They got shut out by Antonio Senzatella and and a few uh, relievers. So that that's it's never a good sign. You know, the offense is is really scuffling right now. Um, but hey, <laughs> they got to pick it up. Yeah, they're know, due, they're, right? They're, it's not gonna fly. It's not going to fly this week. Let me just put it that way. You know, if you're losing two out of three to the Rockies, uh, you're probably going to get swept by the Braves and Giants if your offense, you know, performs at that level. Yeah. Well, the good news is the pitching has been good. So uh, I'll, I'll, you 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 go for it. Your next stock up. I know you've got pitching. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have another stock up and it, it's Max Scherzer. I mean, what can we say about what this guy has been since he came over to the Dodgers? He's made five starts. He's 4-0. 155 ERA, 41 strikeouts and five walks in 29 innings. I mean, that's that's even better than advertised. You know, obviously we knew how great Max Scherzer is when the Dodgers traded for him, um, but he's been he's been even better. You know, they've won every single game he's pitched. He's pitched deep into games. You know, he went, uh, you know, seven and two thirds against the Padres the other night, which was obviously a great sign after going 16 innings. You know, the night before you need length there, and and he gave him exactly what they needed so uh you know we had a, a little discussion on our live show the other night uh is it still Bueller for for it? let's say the Dodgers make the wild card are we still going with Bueller or has Scherzer eclipsed him at this point um and, and it's close I mean you can't you can't look at the production Scherzer's given and not be impressed so uh you know hopefully he could continue it it's unfortunate he's not going to be pitching against the Giants this week when when they need him to but uh you know, he's been incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And it's worth noting, I did have some positives on the pitcher. Scherzer, along with Bueller, Urias, Jansen, Bickford, Green, Brule, and Trinan all had scoreless weeks this week. So you're talking about eight different guys on the Dodgers staff who did not allow a run 
in a full week. Uh, that's good stuff. And obviously, that's the only reason we're sitting here having won four out of six when I just gave you, yeah. you know, 10 guys batting under 200 <laughs> yeah. for the week. Um, yeah. I've got one other down, um, and I think we just got two each. But that's Corey Knebel. Um, Past week, three and a third, three earned runs, two home runs, three hits, two walks, two strikeouts. Not not the worst thing in the world, but I guess just the fact that he has he's been okay since coming back. This is a guy that you would expect to be one of the best high leverage arms the Dodgers have. Obviously, he just returned on August 10th. He's made nine appearances. Um, but I think what's concerning is that he's not getting better. You think, oh, well, if he struggled the first four or five games, that's so be it. Well, his worst two appearances have come in his last three. Um, in those nine appearances he's made, he's allowed uh, base runners in seven of them. Uh, of the two in which he did not allow a base runner, one of those was just one batter that he faced. And so he's been okay. ERA over three since coming back, over eight and two-thirds. Um, Ten base runners over that stretch, eight strikeouts. So he's been okay. The past week was rough. But Knable's a guy I'll be watching because the Dodgers are are counting on him. Obviously, Vessia, Bickford, those guys have been so good that the pressure isn't on Knable to be in the Trine and Jansen camp necessarily right now. But he's definitely a guy that over the next 30 one week, 31 games, the Dodgers are going to hope that, that that projection, the production improves. I know you're a big Knable guy. Are you concerned yet, or is it we're still so early in the process of him coming back that, that he's got a lot of time left? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to be a little concerned just because, like, <laughs> you say we have a lot of time left, but we're frankly, we're, we don't have yeah. a lot of time left. You know, we got a month, which, yeah, that's that's time to, you know, get on track. But you also have to consider the fact that they got to win right. games this month. Like, it's not like you could just be, you know, giving guys auditions and, and hoping they could turn it around or whatever. Like, we need guys performing right now. And I guess the question with Knable is is just, can he be a high leverage guy or is he better served as a, a lower lower leverage guy? Which I think all of us hope that, you know, when he was out and, and when he was coming back, we were like, all right, we're getting this high leverage arm back. Yeah. You know, he was so great to start the season. The stuff looked great. We were like, oh, this guy this guy could be one of our best, you know, relievers. And I think that's why he's a stock down for you right now. Not necessarily just because he's been awful yeah. and been getting rocked. It's just because we have those expectations that he can be one of the best. And, and obviously we know the Dodgers didn't go out and get a high leverage reliever, you know, at the deadline, which is totally fine because of what they did. Like obviously getting Max Scherzer and Trey Turner eclipses that, but at the same time, you still need to find those, four or five guys who you could really trust in late late game close situations and and right now the question is can can able be one of those guys so uh, i guess we'll see if he, if he starts to turn it around i think they've been pretty smart about when they've used him like they haven't used him in those huge situations outside of the the 16 inning game when they didn't really have a chance but uh I guess we'll just wait and see if he could figure it out. But if not, you know, that's not a bad guy to have in lower leverage, you know, type of situations. Like, he's still capable of throwing up a zero at any time. We just got to see him do it on a more consistent basis, I guess. Yeah, thinking bullpen, let me throw a question at you, and I'll give you some names here in a moment. Obviously, Jansen and Trinan. Who are the three relievers that maybe you trust the most? You figure the back end of the bullpen, maybe four or five guys that you kind of have in that group that you trust. I'll, I'll throw right. out the guys that are currently on the roster um, and you tell me, um, we've got Bickford, Brule, Gratterall, Green, Kelly, Knabel, um, Vessia, and White. Um, obviously, you could throw a guy like David Price in there. But who are the who are the two or three guys in that group that you feel good about at the back end of the game, if if any? Yeah, I mean, I'd say you you mentioned Jansen and Trinan. They're they're obviously in that group. Um, I'd say <laughs> the next two guys after that are probably right now, you know, Bickford and Vessia. Yeah. They've both been awesome. Uh, obviously, they don't have the track record of doing it over a long period of time, but they've been great all year, and I think they're at the point where they're trustworthy. Um, and then after that, I'd say the next two guys are probably uh, Gratterall and Kelly. Um, you know, they've both been pretty good as well. Uh, you know, Gratterall in particular is kind of starting to figure it out. He's striking out more guys, which is what we've always wanted to see from him. Uh, but the thing with those guys is just consistency. Like, we know they both have the stuff to be elite, uh, obviously, they both throw 100 miles an hour, yeah, so that matter. you can't go wrong there. But just a matter of you know being consistent and going out and doing it every time. So I think that you know they can potentially move into that top group, but right now they're kind of in the middle, which 
if those guys are your middle guys, like you're you're in pretty good shape, I'd say. Yeah, I, I was gonna say Kelly is the fifth guy for me, and I know he just came off of you know one of his worst, not one of his worst, just a not great performance the other day. But yeah, I mean, and that's I don't. I, let me ask you one follow-up. How do you feel about that group? I mean, if I tell you, okay, Bigford and Vessia, the way they're pitching right now, those are your third and fourth best relief pitchers. Are you comfortable mm-hmm. with that? I mean, because they've been really, really good. We're not talking about guys who are just right. exceeding expectations. They've actually gotten to the point where you feel good about them in big spots. So are you comfortable with where the bullpen is at right now? Uh, I think to me, in a perfect world, you would have – one more guy in that group that you could trust. And that would be Knable for me. Yeah. Like idea in a perfect world, he, he starts pitching how we know he's capable of, and he's added to that group. And then you feel a lot better about it. Yeah. I think right now I feel good about it. Like all those guys have been pitching really well. You, you, you threw out the stats, you know, <laughs> the Dodgers would not be winning games the way they are right now. If it wasn't for their pitching, you know, the, the offense has been that bad. So I think you feel good about it, but uh, obviously you like to feel great you know you like to be like oh we got a lockdown bullpen that we could go to at any time they're gonna hold any lead and uh you know i don't think anyone any team has that you know (laughs) even if you have three of the best relievers in baseball there's still the possibility you know of something going wrong so so i think i feel good which which is you know not bad right now but i think it still could get better i think if canable uh, you know, starts to show what what he can. That that's another arm added. Then you talk, you start to look at starters as well. Guys yeah. are coming back. You know, Kershaw, uh, Danny Duffy, um, you know, Tony Gonsolin. And then you start to say, you know, who's who, which of the starters are going to be in the bullpen as well. You know, maybe David Price moves back to the bullpen. Yeah. You know, who knows? Maybe if Kershaw can't get built up, then maybe he's you know a long reliever or something. Which I don't think that's in their plans at all i think he's he's a starter and but you never know yeah. like if time's running out and it's the back half of september and he can't get built up you got to contribute any way you can so i think they have the arms to be an elite bullpen uh right now they're a really good bullpen which you'll take but uh let, let's just hope before october some of those other guys you know come on and then and then you know that's if if you could add two more guys to what they got right now that's the best you know the best you're gonna get yeah yeah, and Victor Gonzalez is another name who, who maybe there's optimism and hope that he could sort of regain some form in the next month or so. I don't think we're optimistic about it, but I think it's we've seen yeah. him do it. Um, but Duffy's another guy that you mentioned. I like the quote that you gave me. I feel good, which is not bad. So uh, that's, that's yeah. the hard-hitting analysis that we're here to provide. I feel good about it, which is not bad. Um, anyway, <laughs> hey, you get 35 minutes into a show, and it's just free flow, and there's no editing here. So that's, that's what happens here. I've said much stupider things yep. than that. Um, well, let's shift gears. Let's go to some quotes. And we're not trying to be negative here, but we'll start with everybody's favorite topic of conversation in Dodger world right now. Uh, Cody Bellinger, you, Daniel, you might be shocked to hear this quote from Dave Roberts, but quote, the at-bats are much better. He's getting unlucky. When you're where Cody's at, you want results any way you can get them. He's working really hard and fighting, which I love. He's competing, which I love. The results, it's going to turn. It's going to turn. When it does, I've said it before, it's going to be fun to watch. I'm just going to let that one sit there for you. Uh, I have some feelings and opinions on this one, but uh, I'll turn to you. Quote, the at-bats are much better. He's getting unlucky. Uh, agree or disagree with our friend Dave Roberts? I mean, I, I like the optimism, but I don't necessarily agree that the at-bats have been all that much better. Um, you know, the numbers numbers are what they are. Obviously, they're not good at all, but I don't. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't seen a large, you know, increase in at bat quality out of Cody. There's been times where he puts up good at bats, yeah. um, but it, yeah. it's not consistent enough for me to be that optimistic. I guess, um, you know, I, I I'd say I've been the optimistic one on Cody on this show pretty much all season. Yeah. But you know, at some point, <laughs> you can't keep saying it's gonna turn around. Like it has to turn around. Like here we are. It's about to be September. He's now been playing for a while now like it's not like he just got back from injury last week or anything so uh yeah I I don't know how I feel about that you know I think hopefully you know with uh with all all their guys being healthy now hopefully we see those rest days you know few and far in between moving forward and that leads to Cody probably being in the lineup less um But, but yeah, to me, to me, the at-bat quality hasn't been super high. Yeah, it's Major League Baseball, Dave. Uh, it does not have to turn around at some point. Like, you don't just get to be yeah. a 250 hitter just because, you, you know, you're working hard. Um, I don't get it. Right. I don't get it. I don't see any improvement in the at-bat quality. 
Uh, he looks just as lost. He's swinging through just as many pitches. He's walking just as little. He's striking out just as much. Every time someone sees him hit a home run, they think he's turned it around. And I've said, I almost think those home runs are hurting him because he, it just convinces him that somehow what he's doing is working when it is clearly not. Um, I don't blame Dave Roberts for saying any of this. Publicly, he has to. I just can't believe that he actually thinks this and believes this in his heart of hearts, that the hitting staff is watching video and breaking down tape and sitting with Bellinger and saying, no, 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 you're doing great. Keep it up. Um, I did some numbers on this. Um, I was joking with you before the show. Um, I've been negative on Cody Bellinger for a while. Maybe that's because I've had to sit with him on my fantasy team for the whole year and figure out whether or not to drop him or not, which I'm afraid to do. Um, I just so, it's a, Yesterday, Cody Bellinger makes an unbelievable catch in center field. An unbelievable catch. It was great. It's exactly why he's out there. He plays great defense. And it felt like the Bellinger defenders wanted to take a victory lap of, this is why the guy plays center field. This is why the guy's out there to make plays like this. He just saved a run. Yes, absolutely. Saved a run. I don't think these people understand how bad he has been offensively because saving a run is a very obvious, tangible thing. It's a lot harder to quantify the number of runs he has cost them offensively, um, including defense. Fangraphs has Cody Bellinger as a negative wins above replacement player this year. Negative 0.4 wins above replacement. His weighted runs created plus, this is a number where 100 is league average. Cody Bellinger's offensive number is 57 this year, which basically means he's 43% worse than average offensively. So even if he were 43% better than average defensively, that would make him an average baseball player if he weighted offense and defense equally. To give you context on that 57 number, Billy McKinney is 62 for a Dodger. So he has actually been better offensively. Taylor and Pollock, the two guys that we're talking about competing with playing time for, are 131 and 135. So they are 80% better than Cody Bellinger offensively. I mean, th those numbers speak for themselves. I will be so fascinated to see how Dave Roberts plays this because I don't know how you justify playing Cody Bellinger more than three out of every five or six games. I just don't see it. So far he has. He's played three of the last four. I'll be curious to see. But on that first quote, I don't see the at-bats getting better. I don't think he's getting unlucky. Um, and I'm not convinced he's going to turn it around. A next quote here. This one was a longer one, but this is uh, on the conversation. The Dodgers had two guys that they had to send down. They decided to send down Matt Beatty and Gavin Lux. Um, Dave Roberts was asked, what do those guys have to do to come back? Quote, this is a tough day for me personally, obviously, for those two players. Matt's been very good for us over the last few years. Big hits. I've leaned on him numerous times in the regular season and postseason. It's a roster crunch. Nothing to do with his performance. There's no messaging as far as work on this or that. He's done everything I've asked of him. So it's just more of a player that has options, gets to take at bats every day. Hopefully we get him back at some point. Very difficult because he's a major league player. With Gavin, it's more a player that has options and obviously a player we value in the short and long term giving him the option to go play. This time where our roster is at, he's not an everyday player, but obviously that's the light we see in him at some point. To get one at bat every five days just makes sense for him to go down, start getting at bats. He's working on some things mechanically. He's going to play. Again, difficult conversations, but the bar is pretty high. Interesting note about this is that they he went on to say that Gavin Lux is going to play third base and right field when he goes down and plays in the minors, which I think is interesting because you compare him to a guy like Billy McKinney and say, well, can he give you, you know, close to the defense of McKinney, which presumably far better offense. One last question on Lux. Roberts was asked, has, has the perception of what his ceiling is changed this year? Quote, no, I don't think so. I don't think he's performed the way we would have liked, certainly. I think if you're talking about a runway, he's had a good runway. I'm sure he's disappointed with the way it's gone. We make a trade. We've got to win baseball games. He understands that. My messaging, we had a great conversation, was to go out there and control what you can control, get better, play well, and get back to help us win a championship. We talked a little bit about this on the post-game show. I think from a numerical perspective, it just somebody had to get sent down. McKinney had no options. They op decide to opt ba option Beatty and Lux. Any any issues with the decisions or reactions to anything Roberts had to say? No issues. Um, I will say, you know, September 1st is two days away. And, and no, you don't get 40 roster spots the way he did in years past, which was always ridiculous to me. But the roster does increase from 26 to 28. So I'm assuming we'll see one or both of those guys back on the big league roster on September 1st, which means it was just like a week thing or whatever, you know, no harm done. Um, I, I understand why they had to do it. You know, you know, part of the reason was they were coming off that 16 yeah. inning game. They needed an extra arm, you know, the following day. Um, but for me with Lux in particular, it makes more sense for him to be at AAA right now. Um, he needs to be getting at bats 
pr- pretty much every day. You know, he's still young and developing. And also, you you talked about the positions. You know, he's going to be playing third base and right field, which are brand new positions for him. You know, he's a shortstop and a second baseman. Um, so so I, I and ideally, you know, you you allow him to play those positions at the minor league level where the stress is relatively low yeah. um and he gets more experience there and then when he comes back up to the big leagues you have a guy who's capable of playing those positions because i think what we saw whether i i think it was like a week or two ago um when gavin lux first came off the il like he was put in the start at third base you know the very first game yeah. um and we saw how that worked out you know he made a couple errors obviously we know his throws in general aren't great no matter where he's playing and and moving from <laughs> second base to third base is not going to help that you know it's only going to hurt that so i think him getting more time to get acclimated to those positions while while getting at bats every day makes you know a lot of sense it's not like he was making a huge impact at the big league level that's like oh crap like we're missing Darn. gavin lux right now like like our whole offense is sluggling but if only we had Gavin Lux over the weekend like maybe we would have swept the Rockies like no that's not the case at all so makes sense for him I'd say Beatty will probably be the first one to come back because to me with him he's not really a developing player like he is what he is you know whether he's getting every day at bats at the AAA level or coming off the bench in the big leagues there's not a whole lot of difference there um, he's proven to be a solid bench bat at times but nothing nothing you know extraordinary it's kind of similar to Lux it's not like they were missing him over the weekend or anything so we'll see him soon um, but I think Lux, honestly, I, we'll see when he comes back up. I think they would probably want to give him at least a couple weeks to kind of find his footing because to me, to send him down and then bring him back up a week later after playing like three games or something, that that doesn't make, you know, a, a huge difference or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. And keep in mind Zach McKinstry, another guy that's down at AAA right now who, right. who who's in the right. same conversation. So you said it, a couple spots right. coming. You would imagine one of those is a bullpen arm. If, if the bullpen is so taxed that Justin Turner needs to pitch in a five-run game, then you would hope that, that, that we get a bullpen arm there. But, uh, yeah, interesting yeah. to see how that plays out. Um, one last one on the quotes, then a Kershaw update in a week, uh, a preview of the games ahead. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on the opener. Um, there was, he was asked, Dave Roberts was asked about Gratterall starting on Friday. Um, Gratterall pitched one in, gave up two earned runs, and then was piggybacked by Andre Jackson, who went four and two-thirds, allowing just one earned run. Uh, he said, quote, as far as, far as the idea of the opener, it's let Brewstar take the first three or four hitters, have Jack, Andre Jackson, go through a certain part of the order a couple times. In our opinion, it just gives him the best chance to maximize his pitch count, which is kind of 80 to 90 pitches. The Dodgers went with an opener Friday and Saturday in Gratterall and Knebel. Friday, it didn't work. Two earned runs, down one nothing before your starter ever comes into the game. Saturday, it worked okay. Knebel, one and two-thirds, no earned runs. David Price, three and two-thirds, two earned runs. Sunday, interestingly enough, at the same situation, they opt to go with Mitch White right off the bat, and he gives up a home run to C.J. Crone in the first inning. So this isn't necessarily a playing the results situation here. I understand the thinking on Friday. Hey, the teams, the opposing team's best hitters are in the one through four holes, so let's get Gratterall, right. who's a better pitcher than Andre Jackson, for one inning. Let's get him against those and then bring Andre Jackson in. I wonder if that messes with a guy like Andre Jackson, who's a starter, David Price, probably a little bit more flexible, but not being able to start the game, come out of the bullpen, etc., just briefly, what are your thoughts on the opener as a whole? Do you like the Gratterall and then Jackson move, the Knable and then Price move, or would you prefer that they just go with the standard, let Jackson throw 90 pitches and then go from the bullpen from there? Yeah, so I used to be not in favor of the opener at all. And, and to me, the reason was when you look back at that that one Mitch White outing where he tosses uh, seven and a third, you know, scoreless relief appearances and and we talk about how taxed the bullpen is has been right like that that night could have been a case of if you start him and he pitches the same way he did maybe he goes complete game or maybe he gets through eight innings and then you save the you know I know they only used one guy I think it was Justin Brule in that game but you would have been able to save him because Mitch White you know has it going and, and they were up big or whatever Um, so that to me is why I never liked the opener, but in my opinion, it makes sense the way they did it over this past weekend. Like you said, when you look at that Rockies lineup, like the top four was actually not bad. And then it kind of falls off after that. Um, so, so in this case, you know, so let's use Andre Jackson, you know, he's not going to face the order three times. He's, if he starts the game, he's probably going through the order twice. And then you're going to bring in a reliever in the fifth in the fifth inning or whatever, when the top of the order comes up. But in this scenario, because you use the opener to get through the top of the order once he could face 
the bottom of the order three times while only facing the top of the order twice. Yeah. And, and that might buy you an extra inning or so. So so to me, it makes sense in that scenario. I get what you're saying, like as far as mentally, like Andre Jackson's been a starter, the adjustment to being a reliever. I, d I don't know if that has an effect at all. Like, I guess that depends on every individual kind, kind of. Um, but I, I think it made sense the way they did it. I obviously wouldn't want to see them do it with any of like their main yeah. guys. Like, obviously you're not doing that with Scherzer, Bueller, or, or Julio. But to me, with those, with those fringe triple a guys who you know are only going to face the order twice anyways uh to me it actually it actually makes some sense and i know it didn't work out that first night um you know when i think who was it canable Gr got rocked Gr a little bit got rocked on friday it was, Gr it was gratterall that night yeah it was gratterall um but you know that just didn't work out you can't really look at that and say that's the yeah. reason why you lost the game and also you also can't look at that and say if we would have started andre jackson and brought in gratterall and the fifth or sixth or whatever, like the result would have been any different. Yeah. Like who knows? Maybe he gets up those homers in the sixth inning if he's pitching, and then it, you know it's the same well, scenario. Yeah, the concern is for this the the bulk guy, right? The concern is how is the bulk right. guy impacted by this? And Andre Jackson pitched fine. Now I think the numbers are misleading. He's giving up a ton of base runners, only one earned run. So so be it. So that kind of worked out. Like to me, it's less about how does Gratterall pitch in the first, and more about how does Jackson pitch two through seven. Sure. Um, price, sure. way more flexibility with him. He's been out of the bullpen. He's a vet, so not worried there. It's interesting to me that then Sunday, though, you go to Mitch White right out of the gate. So you have this plan with Andre Jackson, and for some reason you treat Mitch White radically different. I, I don't know what the thought process there was, um, but he obviously got burned. Maybe by. it was just because of how well he threw in his last sure. outing that he kind of earned a start. But, but yeah, to me, I'm, I'm with you. Like, if, if you're going to do it for Jackson, then – you might as well do it for Mitch White, too, because it's not like I know he had one great outing, but it's not like he's on some other level totally. like the Jackson isn't on. Like they're pretty much in the same category. So. So, yeah, to me, you should be doing it for both of those guys if you're going to yeah, do it. Yeah, and like, White at all. gets rocked the first time through the lineup. So Crow yeah. hits the home run. So <laughs> it's kind of like the exact reason you have claimed to use an opener on Friday and Saturday comes back to bite you on Sunday. It doesn't make any sense to me. Exactly. But anyways. Um, one last thing before we get to the week preview. Let me give you a Kershaw update. This is from Mark Pryor about a bullpen that Kershaw threw, I believe, on Saturday. Um, quote, I think it was a good step forward. I think the most important thing right now is we're going step by step. He was able to throw his normal pregame or in-between starts bullpen right around 34 pitches. Went through all his pitches. I thought the command of his fastball was good. I think the breaking stuff at times was there. You could kind of see it going in and out as far as the effectiveness of it. I think it was another good step forward. We'll see how he comes out of it and make plans for whatever the next step is. It might be another bullpen, potentially face hitters. Not quite sure. I think it's more of a read and react and progress from there. So the Dodgers are on a plan where they're hopeful that he can be back in the next two to three weeks, make two starts before the end of the season. There's not a ton to go off other than this seems like a positive thing. This seems like a box that got checked. It's one of those moments where if there's any setback, then the whole plan goes off the rails. But so far... Yeah. Step maybe let's say we're on step three of eight. <laughs> step three was a check. So good news there from Kershaw. Anything else that you've seen or heard that makes you pessimistic about his ability to build back up? Or so far, it seems like things are on track. Yeah, I mean, you, you just made the exact point I was going to make. Like, everything is fine now. He seems to be progressing. Every update we've gotten is positive, which is, you know, a good thing. Uh, but we're at the point where... <laughs> If he suffers any sort of setbacks at this point, yeah. like then the whole thing is just kind of, you know, scrapped and you got to figure out what you're going to do after that. You know, it's 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 an elbow forearm issue. So that's you obviously want to proceed with caution to begin with there because you, you definitely don't want him in a situation where he has to undergo Tommy John or whatever. Um, so, so you're already, you know, moving slowly. But when you look at the calendar, you know, he's. He's running out of time here, you know. Yeah. He's if he wants to come back as a starter, you know, the building up process that takes time too, and he's not even facing hitters yet, so he's still probably a week or two away from that, and then he's gonna have to take two more weeks to build up, which means he's probably only gonna start one or two games to end the regular season before the postseason. So, you know, if everything stays on schedule, then they're fine. They'll get him back, and and hopefully he's healthy and ready to go for the postseason. That's that's all good. But we're at the point where if he suffers any sort of setbacks at this point, then his season could be done or or we'll have to talk about him maybe coming back in some sort of relief role, which, you know, I don't even know if you feel comfortable with that <laughs> yeah. if he's dealing with an, an, an arm injury. Like, you don't want to have him in a completely different routine. Like, he's been a starter his whole career. He knows exactly how long it takes him to get loose or whatever. And, 
when you're in the bullpen, you don't exactly have that luxury. Maybe they could find a way to script it out for him. Like you're pitching the sixth and seventh innings of this game. So you have as much time as you need to be ready, but that's still not a perfect scenario. Like yeah. they want him to come back as a starter. So hopefully he continues to progress. He's like, like I just said, all the, all, all the updates have been positive to this point and, and that's all you could hope for. You know, yeah. we don't, we don't know exactly what he's feeling or dealing with, but we could just hope that, that, you know, everything stays in the right direction from this point forward. Yeah. And, and a positive news on Tony Gonsolin. He seems like he's about one step ahead of Clayton Kershaw. I believe he threw a two inning bullpen session of some sort and came out of it positive. So, those are both guys that, if you're looking at the starting rotation, would be huge boosts to the team if, if, that, if either sure. of those guys could be your number four starter come postseason time or even come stretch time. Because, again, yeah. we're not just talking about the postseason. We're talking about a team that's going to be in a fight not to have to play in that wild card game. Yeah. One other good news yeah. from the week, A.J. Ellis saying Clayton Kershaw going to retire a Dodger, which if there's one source that I trust outside of the Kershaw family, <laughs> it's probably A.J. Ellis. So good news there. Um, let's close. We got a few minutes left. Let's look at the week ahead. The Dodgers start with a three-game set against the Atlanta Braves. Uh, the Braves, one of the hottest teams in baseball, dating back to Oct uh, August third. They won eighteen of their last twenty-three, so eighteen and five. They just took two out of three from the Giants. Um, over that stretch, their starting pitchers are third in baseball in ERA. Relievers are thirteenth um, on the season. Big picture, they're eighth in runs scored per game, just a tick under five. Um, and the starters is where the change has been. They, they, on the season, they're 11th in starting pitching ERA. As I said, over the last three to four weeks, they're third. Uh, the matchups, Urias versus Smiley, Bueller versus Morton, and Scherzer versus Freed. So some good matchups there. This is a really good team. Um, as you said, I mean, it, we're this isn't the Rockies and the Padres. We're talking about a next level up type of matchup here with the Braves. So before we get to the big series against the Giants, anything about that matchup that jumps out to you when the Braves um, come to play the Dodgers. Yeah, I mean, you laid it out. The Bra the Braves are, are playing good baseball right now. I think everyone kind of thought, like, when uh, Acuna went down, like, oh, like, this just isn't the Braves' year. Like, they're just going to kind of fold and, and be done. But that hasn't been the case. You know, they made some solid uh, trade deadline acquisitions. One of them was our, our, our good friend, Jock Peterson, who who made a, a nice catch in right field the other day to, to save Defensive a game and beat specialist. the Giants. That was that. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, that, that catch probably should have been easier than he made it look, but he still made it. That's, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the Braves are playing well and this is an important series. You know, you gotta, you gotta kind of keep things going in the right direction. Uh, you know, the, the, the giants, they're playing the brewers this week. So that's a t another yeah. tough opponent for them. Um, so you hope, you know, you hope the brewers could go in there, take care of business, win two out of three or whatever. And then if you win uh, two out of three against the Braves, you pick up a game, you're a game and a half back going into to the weekend series against the, the Giants. I think that's an ideal scenario right there. Obviously, we'd like better. We'd love a sweep and the Giants to get swept and, and then we're in first place going into the weekend. But I don't think that's realistic the way things have kind of played out uh, recently with how well the Giants are playing. So if you could pick up a game. Uh, that puts you in a really good spot going into the weekend. And I know it won't be easy. You mentioned the Braves starting pitching. That, that's probably been the biggest reason for their turnaround. I'm not, I haven't looked who the Dodgers are going to see yet, but pretty much all their guys have been thrown well. Uh, you know, Charlie Morton and Max Fried have both really uh, stepped up their game in the second half. So should be a tough series. You know, it's a rematch of the uh, NLCS. So, you know, the Braves are probably coming in with some uh, extra motivation after blowing the three run, uh, a three, one lead in that series. So uh, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but I definitely think you have to take at least two out of three just to kind of keep things going in the right direction. Yeah, Smiley, Morton, and Freed are the three that the Dodgers are expected to see. Okay. Um, the Dodgers have played the Braves once already um, in Atlanta. They lost two out of three in that series. Charlie Morton, five innings, two earned runs uh, in one of those games, and then Max Freed, six innings, one earned run uh, in the other. So both of those guys have pitched well against the Dodgers. Again, though, you've got Urias, Bueller, and Scherzer. Those three guys on the mound, right. you need to win two out of three. It doesn't even matter who the opposing team is. Um, that leads us to the Giants. We've talked about the rotation and how it's going to stack up. Price expected on Friday versus Desclafani. Urias versus Cueto and Bueller versus Wood. Um, we know Giants pitching has slipped a little bit. You do get Urias and Bueller. Obviously, Friday, you feel really not great about the pitching matchup there. Um but, I mean, you know, looking at this one and you say, okay, you got a day off Thursday. Um, it is in San Francisco Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, 
But, I mean, what do you see when you look at this one? Again, we don't need to rehash that we wish we had Scherzer here. You don't feel great about Price versus Desclafani, but Urias you like better than Cueto, and Bueller you like a lot better than Wood. So does this feel like a, a two out of three to you? I, I mean, yeah, I think it has to be at this yeah. point. If you want to win the division, you can't lose that series. That means you're losing ground. Um, so, yeah, and I honestly think now that you're reading those pitching matchups, it works out pretty well in favor of the Dodgers. Um, you know, Desclafani's having a great year, but we've talked on the show in the past. If you look up his numbers against the Dodgers compared to the rest of the league, uh, you know, the Dodgers have hit him pretty well. Um, I also think they've hit Alex Wood pretty well. So, but, but the good thing is the Dodgers, they don't have to see Gossman who hasn't been as good as of late, but he's still, you know, one of the guys who's kind of in the Cy Young mix having an all-star season. And you also don't have to see Logan Webb, who's been, uh, you know, outstanding over the last month and a half. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but he's been one of the best pitchers in baseball. So the fact that you're avoiding those two guys, uh, you know, that's a positive. You know, you mentioned how we don't have Scherzer, so that's a positive in the Giants' favor. But I think overall, uh, you know, that sets up really well for the Dodgers to win at least two out of three. Yeah, and Desclafani, even, if you look at over his last 28 and a third innings, so that's seven starts, he's allowed 19 runs. So, um, you know, you're talking about an ERA well north of what he's expected of himself. He's got an ERA of almost six in the month of August. Um, so, and, and that's the, that's the, the matchup that you feel the worst about. So you hope that at some right. point the, the, they can flip the switch and uh, and pull this one together. But um, yeah, it definitely feels like it, this needs to be a four and two week. Um, you need two out of three from the Braves and you need two out of three from the Giants. Obviously, hey, we'll take a sweep in either direction. We're perfectly comfortable yeah. with that, especially against the Braves. Um, at home and you know with your three best pitchers on the mound but man I mean like you said this is the biggest week of the season it does feel like if the Dodgers can't gain at least one game on the Giants by the end of this week then it's going to be a a much more challenging obstacle knowing that you don't have any more matchups for the Giants so this feels like to me they need to be picking up one game a week basically for the next six weeks or so to to sort of obviously that would put them well in front of that would be a three-game division lead but that's kind of the mentality I'm thinking of, you know, whatever the giants are going to do, you need to be able to do one better. Um, And obviously to have three against the giants uh, is a big one there. We also have one other matchup, your fantasy team versus my fantasy team last week of the season before the playoffs, I'm fighting for the number two spot. I believe you're just a few games back in fourth place or fifth place right now. Uh, So big matchup between trust the process and uh, I don't even remember what my team is called currently. Kershaw, Kershaw to champ. champ. That's right. Need everybody to know. Uh, I picked up your boy Chris Paddock today for the two starts he gets Arizona. How do you feel about me adding Chris Paddock against you? You feel good about that? I did not see that, but uh, yeah, I'm feeling real good. <laughs> was, that, that's a solid pickup by you. That's your boy. That's your boy. I feel like Paddock, you need extra motivation against Daniel, knowing that this guy's just talked massive smack about him for the last couple of years. Playing the Diamondbacks. Let's be honest. We'll put it in context there. First trip off the IL. Well, I think I think the last time the Padres faced the Diamondbacks, that they got uh, swept. So I don't know if that's a, that's a friendly yeah. matchup there. No, but honestly, either way though, we're both we're both in the playoffs, which is a good thing. So uh, you know this this matchup, it'll be fun. I hope I win. But you know, as far as the standings go, there's not. You're. you're I got. I'm playing we, for we second both, place. Probably. Second place is in play for well, me in a buy. I, I it's also in play for me. I, we're all pretty much uh, jumbled up there in the standings. You're. You're tied for second place, and I'm yeah, I'm four games back. So like, if I if I beat you, you know, pretty badly, I can make up that ground. But hey, you're the Dodgers. Uh, yeah, you're the Dodgers way. playing the Giants in this situation, controlling your own destiny yeah, to true. some degree here. So there you go. True, true. But yeah, e- either way, we're both making the playoffs. Though it's been, we've both overcome adversity to be in this spot, um, specifically from our Dodgers yeah, players. You've Lord. had Cody Bellinger just racking up over fours in your lineup all year. I used my first round pick on Trevor Bauer. And I offered, uh, we, we almost how- traded. I almost traded you Bellinger for Bauer. And I don't know who would have been. I think I, I think you ended up like, I feel like you could at least, you dropped Bauer at least. Bellinger is still taking up a roster spot yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That trade wouldn't have worked out for, <laughs> what a disaster. for anybody. What a disaster. <laughs> Anyways. All right. Hey, a couple things for this week. Uh, Thursday is an off day for the Dodgers. Matt Moreno and I are going to be on this channel live doing a preview of that series. So be sure to put that on your schedule. I think we're going to throw something out there. I can't remember what time we decided on, maybe 7.30 or 8 p.m. on Thursday. So be on the lookout for that. And then we're probably going to do a live post-game show of some sort on Saturday. I know Daniel's out of town this weekend. So it might be me and Matt. It might be me and somebody guest filling in. We'll see. But hoping to do a live post-game on Saturday. 
Daniel and I will be back next Monday uh, breaking it all down and looking ahead to, uh, to the final stretch with no Giants games on our schedule. So, as always, we appreciate you joining us. Check out DodgerBlue.com for the latest DodgerBlue 1958 everywhere on social media. Um, that's Daniel Starkin. I'm Jeff Spiegel. We appreciate you. Subscribe. Ring the notification bell. We'll see you later this week. Lots of content coming ahead of the Giants series. And again, hopefully we get a 4-2 and two week, maybe even 5-1, and one, pick up a game on the Giants. The best team holding a trophy high in the air. The Los Angeles Dodgers, champions of the baseball world.